So many problems have been discussed by so many mentors in the last two days. I'll say in advance, you know, there's not much to say on that alone. But I have a problem that I have gone through in my life many times. We can call it the problem of too many loves. Sometimes it's a good problem. In science and in building careers, it can be a bad problem as well. So multiplicity and pruning is a topic I took. And to, I guess, give it a framework, I've been interested in computers forever. I finished my MBBS in 1994. Like all people graduating from Ames, I went on to do a residency, fellowship, pulmonary disease, critical care. Got a chance to work in the lab of another physician scientist, three years, and really decided I love this work. But I did love medicine also, and I loved computers also. And there's so many different directions one could go, you know, this way, that way, or what I like in this slide simply is another way. My first exposure to research was really, really simple. At the end of medical school, it was known that you can measure the product of airway resistance and volume in people breathing very quietly. The trouble was to measure the volume, you have to make them breathe like And you know, young kids can't do it. Older people can't do it. Dogs can do it, but we don't want to know the lung volume of dogs. So the issue was, why can't we measure this lung volume? And I was just discussing this with somebody else one day. And I said something very simple. If you can measure the product, why don't you just measure the product twice? The second time, introduce additional resistance. Take the difference of the two. Divide by the resistance that you have put into the circuit. And you can calculate lung volume in a quietly breathing person. This ended up becoming my first paper. That, by the way, was the circuit we created. And this paper turned out to be the first paper and the next paper that would come two decades later that went in without a single word being changed, single shot. And the reviewer was basically like, why didn't anybody else do that? I never took it all the way to making a human product out of it. We took it paid in, but I went off to do residency in the US. But I learned a very important lesson. There is always scope to improve upon what exists. And sometimes it's really simple, right below your eyes. But you can't see it because they're blind spots. Probably the doctors who are facing the trouble in getting the patients to pant didn't think about the methods. The people who made the methods didn't think much about how difficult it is to get you know, your patients. Because you know, normal people pant very easily. But who cares about the values of normal people? In clinical medicine, you are talking about diseased people, and diseased people don't pant easily. So this became the point of view that perhaps two different disciplines miss a lot of simple stuff that if you simply have a point of view that is closer together, you will see it. I was very lucky to be mentored by some exceptional people. I went after MBBS. I actually applied for a PhD with Dr. Joe Rarte, who is one of the gods of the world of lung physiology. He wrote back saying that you are a medical doctor. You seem to have done well. Why don't you come for a residency? You will get paid more. And in the process, you can do the research with me anyway as part of a program Baylor had called the Merit Track. Half the time you spend in bench research. Unfortunately, after I joined him and he taught me a lot, he developed pancreatic cancer and he knew he would not survive very long. So he asked me to start working with Professor Burton Dickey, who was a molecular biologist. He told me, look, you know physiology well. You already know medicine well. But molecular biology, that's really the future. And you need to work with somebody who understands that. I'm an old engineer, computational physiologist. I don't know that. So I worked with Burton, mm -hmm. who warned me once that you know I was heading more and more towards this problem of loving what my colleagues were doing, but not doing enough work on my own. But he taught me some very important skill sets. And I mean, I was lucky enough to have a mentor. Perhaps you don't. But these are the things. Channel your ambition. You want to do really well. But what are you going to do really well in? What's the good question? You heard great talk about that this morning. Economy. Economy of effort, economy of thought, don't go all over the place. Economy of words was particularly important in terms of my writing skills. Collaboration. You can't do everything on your own. You have to identify people to work with and to learn to do it well. Grant writing. Money makes the mere go round. You have to learn how to attract money. And communication. Without communication, you can't impress people. You can't do, curb I mean, there's a word in medicine called curbside consults. 
you catch an important doctor in the hallway, you want to ask him a question in two minutes before he gets in the elevator, you put the question to him. So in that sense, you know, medicine training was good. In two minutes, can you summarize your ideas if you're talking to somebody important? I started as a tenure track assistant professor at Baylor. We were on an NIH grant, R01. And then I moved to IGIB in 2007. I did my PhD somewhere between here in 2007. And then the transition came towards a young investigator moving towards becoming a PI. These were different challenges. Lab management. Until you run a lab, you haven't done a lab. Networking. Uh, Professor Balram Ghosh and Professor Brahmachari at IGIB were two very important resource people. Dr. Ghosh was a selfless person who ran a great respiratory disease biology program in which he let me enter and work with his students. And Professor Brahmachari became the Director General of CSIR. He told me some a very interesting advice I never thought about. Mm. He asked me, when you go to a conference, what do you do? Like what else? You know, you highlight all the abstracts that you want to see. You run from one hall to the second hall. He said, by now, you should probably have a problem, no? And you're pretty good at that problem. Probably. You go to conference to meet people, to network, to identify future collaborators. You have to dedicate at least half the time you're going to spend at a conference in proper networking. That's the way science is. And I don't know if this advice is correct or wrong. People could have a different opinion on it. But before that, I ran from conferences from Hall A to Hall B. Most of my medical conferences have 25,000 people in them. They are halls of you know, one, one kilometers across that you run across. And if you simply go and look at posters and listen to talks, you will never get any networking done. You stay in a hall, you find the most important person, you think of a good question, you talk to them. That's probably the most important message Professor Brahmachari gave me. The next phase was of strategic. The word is very important expansion of research activity. Up till 2000, I was focusing on lung physiology. That was my fundamental expertise. With Dr. Dickey, I was working on lung physiology and vesicle trafficking, and we had good collaborators, including Tom Sudoff. He came to the lab. I was supposed to do a project with him. Perhaps it's bad for me, I didn't. But when I came back to India, you had to ask a very conscious question. My boss's lab was still going to be doing exocytosis. He had Randy Sheckman, Tom Sudoff as people he worked with. Am I seriously going to do an exocytosis lab in India with minimal personal skills in the area? Not a good idea. Dr. Ghosh, on the other hand, had lots of skills in microRNA immunogenetics. And I had a substantial amount of insight into lung pathophysiology. Now, could we combine these and do some good work together? And of course, he had to be kind enough to agree, which he was. And I had to know something about this area, which thankfully, because of my clinical background, I did. And we were able to get out the first so-called high-impact papers from India. And these were not first author corresponding author papers. But with a couple of PNSs and nature communication, at least people know you exist in the country, right? I mean, in India, with a couple of PNSs, people do know that you are existing somewhere. And being a physician, I then decided I was going to start a program of my own on the site. As you work this, you get the papers out. And I fit this area, the intersection of lung pathophysiology and metabolic disease. There was lots of epidemiological evidence that people who are obese, people with metabolic syndrome, are high risk for asthma. The other way around as well, people with COPD are high risk to get metabolic syndrome. Since the world was getting obese, I figured that's going to be really important. Epidemics of asthma, epidemics of obesity, this intersection could be really interesting. And the good part was so much money had been put into this area, metabolic disease, the literature was there for the picking. You take some good literature from here, you see what could apply to lung pathophysiology, you work on it, and you're in a niche field of your own, and clearly mm -hmm. respiratory health is very important. And the other thing was to do any clinical research well, you need to have cohorts. Everybody does cross-sectional stuff, you know, they bring in a patient, get some samples, you can never track them, the real value of biomarkers is very rarely for diagnosis. We have plenty of good diagnosis for asthma and COPD. The real value of biomarkers comes from prognosis. Who's going to do poorly? When do you intensify treatment? When do you reduce treatment? There's a toxic treatment. Who deserves this? Who deserves that? Very rarely are doctors interested in biomarkers purely for diagnosis. Because they already have a word for it. They already have a diagnostic procedure for it. You have to prove that your procedure will be better than what they use. Very tough. 
So the larger idea was build a clinical research program, all prospective, with a focus on data. I'd always loved programming, right? But to do that, you already have so much other stuff going on. You have nice animal models of asthma, papers coming out, people keep sending you compound, can you collaborate with us? Can you test this in the mouse model of asthma? But you have to cut down. And the reason you have to do that, I mean, this is not my work. Very nice paper showed, if you knock down the genes important in pruning in the brain, you actually end up with a less complex brain with fewer connections. And that's because the brain goes through phases of making connections, then removing the weak connections, leaving behind diverse, strong connections. And I think research is the same way. I mean, you've seen in this, I was exploring, I was trying out new things, but as one thing settled in, you don't have infinite amount of time. You might find an inheritor to take it over from you, but if you don't, you just have to terminate the program. You do it slowly, you don't inconvenience your collaborators, you don't earn a bad name for yourself, and one fine day you shut this down, but you start accepting less and less of what you consider to be not so good, and start doing more and more of what you believe is the future. And that's another statement you heard this morning, you have to see the future, what's coming. Where is the gap? And here are some potential traps for over-enthusiastic collaborators. Too many cooks. Always stay away from this. When you have too many cooks, you will always find yourself doing more and more of less and less. What you really want to do as you get better and better, perhaps is less and less of more and more, and ideally more and more of more and more, but that's really cool. And it diverts you from your core problems. My core problem has always been the lung. If I simply start pe testing people's compounds and mouse models and no mouse models aren't great models, I'm doing a disservice to my own knowledge of asthma. And mediocrity of objectives. You know, in real estate, they say, well, Trump says he's going to possibly become president. Location, location, location. In research, it's question, question, question. I don't know whether Einstein ever said it, but they said, they, they say that he said, if you lock me in a room with a Question, you know, with a puzzle my life depends on, I'll spend the first 50 minutes framing the right question. The next 10 minutes, if I frame the question correctly, I'll get the answer. I find it amazing that sometimes people don't spend a huge amount of time figuring out the question, the relevance of it, who's going to use it. If you find an answer, who will benefit from it? And can you frame a question in manageable bites? Because you, if you just frame a massive question, What's life? That's not going to help anybody. Although the question is great. Then you might be in the Doug, Ad, you know, the Doug Adams book, The Meaning of Life, question 63. So in the first part of my work, I'm not going to tell you that much about it, but the idea that metabolic syndrome would have a parallel in asthma turned out to be correct. There's a molecule that we focused a lot on, asymmetric dimethyl arginine. What it really does is it binds to nitric oxide. And once it binds to nitric oxide, the electrons cannot flow in attack the nitrogen, creating the nitric oxide. Instead, the electrons go to oxygen, creating superoxides. So your NOS, in the presence of ADMA, becomes a superoxide producing factory. So if you have lots of ADMA floating around, you do lots of damage to cells. We found that ADMA was made in very large quantities in the lung. We found that IL-4, the classical asthma cytokine, completely changes ADMA metabolism. We took a variety of strategies, decrease the ADMA, increase the ENOS, use statins that do both of these, give competitive L-arginine from outside, try decreasing the alginase, and pretty much everything worked. And no nature paper came out of it, but most of these journals are considered good, solid, top-of-the-line society journals, and it gave us a presence in the field. And this area, I mean, at least two of them are going to clinical trial. It's easy to go. You're using drugs that are already approved for human use. You're borrowing completely from this. So the innovativeness of the research in terms of, was it absolutely brand new basic research? No. Not a single thing that we did was completely unknown on this side. But everything was did was very applicable and was repurposing of stuff that was known. This is another work my lab got known for, for no credit to me. This is a student, Tanvir Ahmed, who pretty much built this part of my lab through an observation. He was looking at the electron micrograph of a, we did find before this, that mitochondrial dysfunction is a very important part of asthma. What he was looking at EMs and he said, the part of the epithelial cell close to the mesenchymal fibroblasts shows great quality mitochondria. Is it possible they're donating them? And my first answer was, I don't think so, but let's ask somebody else. 
But in the end, it turned out after asking people doing stuff on our own, that MSCs do donate mitochondria to dying epithelial cells by forming nanotubes. We did figure out the machinery to make the mitochondria go. We did figure out that giving the mitochondria makes asthma and lung injury much, much better. And most importantly, what we found out, if you give them the mitochondria from exogenous sources, the airway remodeling that takes place stops happening, suggesting that the growth of fibroblasts is partly to rescue the mitochondria. And this work that is still ongoing, part of it is published, part of it is yet to come. Meanwhile, I was struggling with the problem of how do you build good quality clinical cohorts. There are no EMRs in India, there are less than 50 hospitals in the entire country that even have the notion of an electronic medical record, even today. Virtually nobody has outpatient medical records, which is where the community is. So I worked with Hewlett Packard in building these health centers. Because India is resource poor, right? We need health centers also. So you build the entire health center inside a shipping container that can be sent somewhere on the back of a truck. The entire workflow is on the cloud. Every time a patient registered, his entire medical record, his diagnosis is accessible to me. And then there's a the kind of work you know, that attracts funding because HP India has corporate social responsibility. They want to spend that money and we can help them spend the money. And this is what it looks like on the inside. The doctor is sitting over here, a bunch of equipment around him. And everything that he measures, the data goes straight from the equipment to the cloud. Minimal concerns about false data, wrong data, time-stamped at the point of collection, and very usable. Side story, I did nothing about machine learning at this point, but had the good sense to hire an engineer and a doctor. The engineer joined my lab and he said, I'm bored of mathematics and all this stuff. I want to do biology PhD. <coughs> Fine. I said, okay, whatever you want to do. The medical doctor said, what I've been doing is so boring. I think I want to do what he used to do. Like, that's good for me too. And a chemical engineer came on a two-month type of a sabbatical, no, internship, whatever they call it. And he knew something about random forest and machine learning. So between four of us, the one who knew it didn't want to do it. One guy had one month of experience, and the other one just wanted to learn. And I knew nothing at all. But what we did do while doing that mitochondria work was generate a huge amount of confocal photos. And what we could see is that mitochondria had shapes that could be classified as donuts. That terminology, unfortunately, has stuck after we used it. So blame me. Blobs and elongated. So we decided, can we count the blobs elongated and the donuts in thousands of images with hundreds of mitochondria each? And obviously, you know, no grad students are going to do it. So what he did, and that's Kunal, he's now in Europe. He made decision trees, he, I mean, now I know how it works. I could explain it, but all of you probably do it anyway. So in the end, we could start classifying mitochondria by shapes. And what we could figure out was that there are particular shapes that correlate with ROS generation, irreversible injury, and some shapes that indicate the point at which the injury is reversible. It was cool stuff, not very, very worthwhile, but we learned something very interesting in the process. Then we said, you know, we have a lot of tools in place. We are getting into the informatics space. I'm in an institute of genomics integrative biology. I have clinical cohorts we are building. We work with large amounts of data. We have great model systems to look at lung diseases at least. And we had raised obese mice, all kinds of mice for cardiometabolic disease. Can we get ready for the big jump? Can we become a part of reinventing medicine? And this is, you know, the Eric Topol book, Creative Destruction of Medicine. I encourage people to read it. He believes that old medicine will be completely changed by a variety of these things, which includes genomics, information systems, informatics, towards the new medicine. And people are publishing things. I'm not saying this is true. I'm simply saying people are publishing these things. The beginning of the end or the beginning in cancer genomics. There's another one called the next 100 years in medicine, where people say, in the future, doctors will use very complex multidimensional characterizations that they can't even understand, simply because they'll perform better. I believe it, actually. I believe they will be reluctant to accept it. I believe they will give you a very hard time because we have a moat around our patients. You may have a good idea, but we decide what happens to them. But eventually things will break down as you go direct to patient. All these creative destructions come when you bypass the system. As patients come to you before they come to doctors, you will be able to break down the system. We were able to get a pan-India presence of our e-health centers. We have 54 of them right now. We are able to see interesting stuff like almost all of the years. I'm sorry, some of this joke will not make sense to some of you. But if you've seen the movie Piku, 
all through the year people come complaining of constipation except for monsoons when they complain of diarrhea this is like pan india 200000 visits already we have 150 no 125000 registered patients we have on the e health centers we have pretty crappy data cause doctors insist on entering in the other section as opposed to drop down columns and they all spell diagnosis differently so it's a huge clean up problem but we'll get to it it's doable we just have to build a new dictionary and i'm not going to tell you much more about the data except that we can track drug usages we can track what do people come to doctors with but mean i'm going to tell you the importance of great collaborators this is dr sandeep salvi from the chest research foundation in pune he thought of a really simple question why do patients come to see doctors in india and he was good enough to get this kind of data done on a single day across india get 8000 doctors to fill in a form indicating the reasons why the patient are there and their complaints and basic medical problems with this kind of a density all over india 8000 doctors 200000 patients and that part we didn't cover because it's actually in pakistan but i use the official government of india map of india not the us map that would be a crime what we could see is that if you now build a symptom just like genome there is a symptom and just like you can do network analysis for genes you can do network analysis for symptoms but it's informative if i told you well i can't i guess there is some problem with this prediction but anyway if i told you that these two were networks on different ages one was for a really old person all the old people and one was for young children below the age of 1 years you could probably tell me that this one on the right is the old man or woman i respiratory circulatory all the young kids are coming in with a skin rash and some respiratory problems so you can tell that the network structure tells you something right now you build the structure for decades of life for all of india and you can start seeing very interesting things and again unfortunately you will not be able to see this what you can see number one as a lung doctor so i have to make a plug for my specialty is the biggest reason for patients to come to see doctors in india is respiratory every age so give us more money than the guys who do cancer and the diabetes guys also by the way this is circulatory so this is called an alluvial graph again in shown to us by konal and tapritesh who is the medical doctor and now becoming a data scientist so what it does is the network connections will stay heavier network the heavier nodes will sink to the bottom and you can see circulatory becomes important around the age of 50 but what you see is endocrine drops down rapidly a decade before that and you can go back to the raw data and you can see indians are typically starting to show diabetes in their 30s and 40s and right about a decade after that in the same area as the diabetes is going up the circulatory is going up and this is actually one module by the end statistically that i have kept the two colors off just to make it look nicer you see some stuff that you didn't expect or you did retrospectively here is anemia you can't see it but right here it is you can see it suddenly became important after the first decade of life remain really important becoming even more important by the 30s and 40 and then suddenly in the 40s goes up and it gets a line here from female genital problems this is menstrual anemia seen in deprived populations of india i could cut this graph into urban and rural this is a rural problem it is a big enough signal that you can see a connection on of it in a global network tells you stuff and you want to know when indians get prostrate trouble let's not leave out the men typically in the 60s but yeah you could cut the data in many ways you could see hypertension is more in cities but respiratory problems were more in small towns less here you know the first year is delhi bombay hyderabad these places are supposed to have good air no you would expect less problems again a brilliant analysis it's called bayesian inference graphing we thought it must be because they use dirty fuel inside their houses as you go away from the cities very obvious thought how do you check it we didn't get from that survey file whether those people use biomass fuel but everybody's got a cook and we don't use electricity to cook so if you're not using lpg liquefied petroleum gas it comes in cylinders in india you are using dirty fuel and lpg sales are recorded so we now create a pseudo parameter into the earlier network 
amount of LPG cylinders sold for the district divided by the population of the district and that's the LPG sales index that you can now plug on to every patient. And now what you can do is something called Bayesian inference networks. Within this data, what connects to this? I'll finish within five. And you can see that obstructive airway disease without any fine tuning of the network connects directly to the obstructive airway disease. You can see quantitative analysis. If you were to increase the penetration of LPG to the highest quintile, obstructive airway disease presentations to doctors would fall by half. That gives you the economic information for policy. That's potentially important to the government that's right now doing a program of give it up that the Indians here would know. And then you can actually go to the ground, you can test these things. This is a village. These are all the houses. These are all the houses with people with COPD. And you can now do distance from roads as a variable. It's a small variable, but it's important. But biomass fuel is the biggest determinant. So you go from a hypothesis generating type of data to actual on ground acquired data. And you need great collaborators to do this. And we have the cohorts, we have the collaborators. And this picture Sandeep likes to show it sheds light on the problem of COPD in villages. You can see the smoke. We are also trying to use existing clinical cohorts better. We have a cohort of about 256 people at AIMS. Every three years, they've been following up. We know every exacerbation. We know everything about them. And we can actually see that the usual clinical classification of mild, moderate, severe, and is not very good. It's, statistically, we will see the difference. But for an individual patient, the usual clinical classification does not predict the likelihood of exacerbation very much. And we're using artificial learning. We already figured out a few things. If your patient smoke, if your house is undergoing renovation, there's dampness in your house. All these are much more important determinations than allergies in India. This experience is not generalizable to outside India. We have got into the process of building better lung function devices. This is 9-11. This is the type of smoke exposure people in the vent. And many of these people had respiratory complaints, but they had absolutely normal spirometry. Spirometry is a test that we do. Are they malingering? Are they just complaining of stuff to get something from the government? No. When you use a different test called IOS, these people who are normal by the gold standard test actually turn out to be positive. So why don't we have more machines like those? They're very expensive. They're very difficult to move around compared to spirometers. And data interpretation is a big challenge. This is a slide from my uh, partners in America, Rice University. Can you make innovations? Can you make them smaller? Can you make better sensors? Can you make better analytics? Analytics, that's what we do. Physiology, that's what we do. And here is an example of using random forest to figure out useful signals from an IOS machine, simplify the entire thing, improve the predictive value. We're able to generate classification graphs like this we can separate people with asthma and COPD. Uh, this was a paper that we had in an advanced stage of review in a prestigious place, but then we decided we would rather make money. So, the Pritesh did this work. He got a nice award for it from the MIT Technology Review. And we have received commercialization funding of about half a million dollars to take this device to market. We are still a basic biology lab as well. I'm not gonna give up my biogamy that easily. We have some very interesting stories on inositol phosphate, phosphatase, a classical molecule thought to signal in the cytoplasm for PI3 AKT. We found a genomic signal for asthma. We can see it goes to the nucleus. We can also see it is exported by healthy epithelial cells in microvesicles to surrounding cells, keeping them in check in a healthy lung. So only when the lung is injured will the remaining cells start proliferating. Beautiful use of a classical signaling pathway. And now that I know eLife is free, maybe I'll send it there. We are still working on a variety of pathways, not tying them together into much bigger models, not discreetly. And with that, I'll acknowledge my funders. I mean, they really paid all the money, and they've been from India and America. And the mentors, the colleagues have tried to show you pictures of some students, but you know, many more people totally were involved, collaborators, family. And it is time to again think about we're gonna get money for the next financial year, which is April for us. And we do have a big lab, and the three of these are not, these are scientists, but yeah, the lab's about that big. Thank you all very much.